My name is Hannah and I'll be talking to you today about our Vernalization 1 and its influence on root system architecture and wheat. So this work uh, I did during my PhD with the Hickey Lab and I did it in collaboration um, with Dr Kai Vosfels, which is also, who is also here at BGRI today. So um, just a bit of a summary uh, of what I'm going to cover today in my talk before we begin. I'm just going to touch lightly on a little bit of background on roots. And then I'm going to talk about how we made this initial um, discovery of the association between Vern 1 and root system architecture. Then I'll discuss how we validated this both in wheat and uh, across species. And then I'll discuss um, the question about whether it was a pleiotropic effect or linkage drag. And finally, I'll end with where we see this research heading next. So root system architecture, and it's um, quite nice that I get to talk after Samir because we've already been hearing a little bit about roots. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about why they're important, what's their genetic basis, I'm going to have a look at what's going on in some of the other crops, and also where we're at with wheat at the moment. So why are roots so important? Well, some people suggest that roots are going to pave the way to the second green revolution. And they believe that this may be possible by developing root systems that can access more nutrients um, with less metabolic costs. And roots are also the gateway to resource acquisition. So they play a huge role in growth regulation. Now, despite their fundamental importance, the functional and genetic basis of root system architecture in a lot of our major cereal crops is relatively unknown. And this is largely due to some of the difficulties we've had in past years with phenotyping. So what do we do when we're struggling with an issue like this in some of our major cereal crops? Well, it's good to look to other crops and see some of the advances that they've done. And rice at this stage has had the most success with understanding the genetics controlling root system architecture. And sorghum's following slightly behind. So with rice, this is the only cereal crop at this stage where they've actually cloned a major gene that influences root system architecture. And this is deep rooting one, or DRO1, which you may have heard of. So DRO1 um, was introgressed into this near isogenic line, which you can see here. And so this was the wide cultivar, and they introgressed the line into, um, and created a near isogenic line. And you can see by just adding this single gene, uh, you've got significantly more roots uh, deeper underneath the crop. Now, there's a bit of speculation as well that it, this steep, cheap and deep root system that's been talked about a bit is expected to be optimal for most cereal crops in most water-limited environments. However, we've just heard from Samir where this may not actually be the case. And this does need a little bit more validation as we go forward um, in a lot of our crops and also a lot of our different environments. But in sorghum, it does seem to be that they are heading this way where a narrow root system uh, is leading to uh, improved yield under water limited conditions. Um, and they've found a few uh, similar genetics that control uh, roots and some of their drought adapted traits. So they've found a correlation between a narrow root system architecture and um, stay green in sorghum. So where are we at with wheat? Well, you've just heard from Samir and we are starting to make some progress. And you'll also hear from uh, Roberto Tuberosa in the next session, who he's also looked at uh, a number of um, studies to identify genes influencing root system architecture. But we can definitely do a little bit more. And there has been some modeling studies in Australia that's shown that for each additional mill of water that we can capture post anthesis, this can lead to significant increases in yield. So if we can modify our root systems to capture more uh, water, be that whether it's from uh, rain or deep in the soil, uh, during this post anthesis time, uh, then we have an ability to improve yield as well. So, I suppose now I'll talk a little bit about how we found this association between vernalization one and root system architecture and wheat. So a lot of this section of the work was done by my colleague uh, Kai, and he based, and sorry, it was done in Germany during his PhD. So he looked at a panel of 220 European winter wheat varieties. These are high yielding commercial varieties and their representation of breeding across the last 60 years. 
And so with this panel, he genotyped them with a 15K Illumina snip array, and he performed some phenotyping. So he looked at the nodal root angle, and he did this using the sieve method, which was used uh, when identifying uh, DRO1 in rice. He ran this experiment three times, and then he calculated a nodal root index, which was uh, used to basically quantify where the roots were penetrating uh, the sieve and giving an idea of uh, the deeper rooting in these lines. He then took this phenotype information and performed genome-wide association um, analysis, and he found a significant uh, marker trait association on 5B here. And this was uh, made up by six significant SNP markers, um, and they were all in strong uh, LD, and they spanned the hom homologue of um, vernalization one on this B genome. So just very briefly, and I'm sure many of you are aware of vernalization one and its role in, uh, in flowering, but it is a key gene that promotes flowering in uh, wheat and a number of cereal crops. So in winter wheat, you do require a prolonged uh, period of cold, and that then induces vernalization one. This down-regulates the negative repressors of vernalization one, specifically vern two, and also upregulates a number of different flowering genes and allows the crop to move in from vegetative to the flowering state. Now, where I'm from in Australia, we don't grow much winter wheat, although I must say there is a little bit more interest coming in for those long season crops. Um, but we predominantly grow uh, spring wheat, and spring wheat is made possible by a mutation in vernalization one. And this mutation in the promoter l means that the crop doesn't need that cold period to flower, and it can progress to flowering a lot quicker and reduce the growth cycle. So that was basically how we initially started going, oh wow, there's something here between Vern 1 and roots and wheat. So we wanted to validate it and have a closer look. So we used some neuroisogenic lines that were previously developed by Dr. Ben Travaskis at CSIRO in Australia. Now these uh, three neuroisogenic lines that we looked at uh, combined a number of different uh, spring and uh, wheat, I'm oh, sorry, spring and winter alleles on the different uh, wheat genomes. So you can see we've got sun state, which has a winter allele on the A genome, and then a spring allele on the B and the D genome. Then you've got uh, CSRI 65, which has a winter allele on the A genome, a spring allele on the B genome, and a winter allele on the D genome. And then you've got the final neuroisogenic line that's got uh, completely winter, so all winter alleles. So what we did was then we looked at the seminal root angle, uh, the mature root angle in the field, and also the distribution of roots at depth in these lines. So Samir's introduced you to the clear pot method. This was also the method that we looked at for these neuroisogenic lines, purely because we could have a very high number of replicates um, and we could do it very quickly as well. So here's some results from um, on uh, some results over here. So what you can see is that as the neuroisogenic line becomes more winter, so it gets more uh, winter alleles, it actually gets narrower. So there's a significant difference as it has an addition of each of those winter alleles. We saw the same results when we did some field uh, analysis as well. So we used shovelomics to look at the mature root system in the field. And you'll see here as well, uh, just on this one down here, that as you increase the number of winter alleles, you increase, um, you, sorry, you narrow your root system architecture. We also looked at the distribution of roots of depth. So we did this using these uh, polypipes. Um, and what we did was we cut them at regular intervals. We washed the roots and we dried them to be able to get an idea of uh, the different amounts of root biomass at differing depths uh, of the different, for the different neuroisogenic lines. And we've represented this as a percentage. So it's um, uh, comparable across uh, crops, across lines, sorry. So we did this at two different time points. So the first graph you can see at the top, that was at anthesis, and the graph below that was um, two weeks following anthesis. So at anthesis, there's not any real clear trends between the neuroisogenic lines. There is uh, one of the lines that's significant at uh, the deepest depth, 
But really the most interesting is what we see at post synthesis. Um, so you can see there that the, uh, the spring line sun state and then um, the other line that has two spring alleles uh, has significantly uh, more roots than the, um, the winter allele there. So another way you could say that is that the winter is significantly different to sun state. So that's sort of showing us that something to do with these spring alleles is pushing more roots, uh, a greater proportion of roots deeper uh, down in the soil. So as I just said, we could we saw that there was a bit of uh, there was difference from these vernalization genes uh, at, at the different stages of growth and also um, in the seminal and mature root system architecture. And we also saw uh, as that the Vern uh, one on the B genome imparts the strongest phenotypic effect, which does uh, is consistent with our GWAS results. We then went across species, and we did this to see whether Vern one has an influence on in barley, which is somewhat related to wheat, and we also did this because uh, the genetic material was available as well. So we looked at neurasigenic lines in barley that had uh, a different numbers, uh, sorry, different spring alleles. So we've got four neurisogenic lines that you can see here. Uh, four of them are different variants of spring alleles. And then we've got the winter allele here. So again, we looked at the clear pot method and did some shovelomics. And what we saw was that in Bali, the different spring alleles result in different root system architectures, which was actually quite interesting. So you can see uh, the first one there Vern 1-1 that had a significantly reduced root system architecture compared to the winter, uh, the winter line. And then Vern 1-3 had a significantly wider root system architecture compared to the winter line. And again, like Samir, what we saw in the clear pot was relatively representative of what we saw in the field in terms of the same trends with our shovelomics. We again had a look at those uh, large pipes and looked at the uh, distribution of root biomass at different depths. So once again, we have uh, the graph on the top is at anthesis for each of the neurosogenic lines. And then on the bottom uh, is a couple of weeks post anthesis. And again, we see a few uh, little trends with anthesis, but mostly we see that post anthesis all of the spring lines, no matter which allele, generally have an improved proportion of uh, biomass at depth. But it's actually only that Vern 1-1, which was our narrowest one here, oh, it's not oh. which was our narrowest line here, still maintains that significant amount of biomass at the deepest depth of 80 centimetres. So that's just one example in Bali, this Vern 1-1, where this steep cheek and deep phenotype does appear to be occurring. And it's also an example of how these different, um, how Vern 1, I suppose, can have an impact for uh, drought escape. So it's this dual mechanism of having an early flowering time to escape most of the stress, as well as having these deeper roots to access more water in the soil if you are growing it in um, soils with high water holding capacity. So now it's about, we were thinking, so we're at this point in our research and we're going, okay, so there is an association between Vern 1 and root system architecture, but is this just linkage drag or is it actually a true pleiotropic effect? And so we looked at this using some transgenic material that we had available to us. And this material was in uh, barley. And the transgenic lines basically were uh, that Vern 1-1 allele, that spring allele that was very narrow and very deep. Uh, it's an extra copy of that. So you've got, as you can see in this bottom graph here, you've got ex uh, increased expression in your um, transgenic line. And what we found at the seminal root angle stage, which you can see on the slide here, so this one here is your transgenic line, has a significantly narrow root system compared to its control, transgenic control. And it was almost half the root, uh, the root angle. And when you look at the mature root system, it's not hard to see that there's a significant difference between the two lines. And when we actually did some image analysis on these large root chambers, we were able to see that at the deepest depths, the transgenic line had a significantly increased proportion of root area at depth as well as root volume. 
But what about the biological mechanism? So we've shown that yes, there's an association, Vern 1 is influencing roots in both wheat and barley, but what's the mechanism? Now, unfortunately, I don't have the answer for you today. We, yeah, it was a bit outside of the scope of my time um, in the Hickey lab, but we did have a very quick first look, and purely because it was something quick that we could look at, and because there has been um, evidence in rice that gravitropism does have an influence on uh, root bending and uh, deeper rooting in rice. So we did um, some gravitropism experiments and we found that uh, there was a significant difference. In this situation, we looked at that barley allele again, um, that there seemed to be a significant difference between that and the control. So in summary, this research uh, was the first to identify an association between this above ground flowering gene and it's having an influence on root system architecture in both wheat and barley. It does appear that gravitropism is a likely biological mechanism, but as I said, there needs to be a lot more research in this area in terms of the mechanism. We did very briefly look at the amount of oxen in the roots, as this was also highlighted in the previous rice research, but we didn't take a targeted enough approach, unfortunately, and you really do need to look specifically at the root tips. Um, so, where do you go to next with this research? Well, as I said, the very clear next step is to look at the biological mechanism. Um, and, as we, and as we actually have just recently published this work earlier this year, uh, also in maize and in pea, they have uh, found associations between vernalization, well, between key flowering genes and our root system architecture. So it seems to be a consistent trend. But from a breeding perspective, what's next is really how we use this information and how we combine these alleles to deploy cultivars with optimum flowering and optimum root systems. And it's not as simple as saying there's one root system that works for all. I think that there's a lot more going on there in terms of what is the preferred root system for certain environments, certain soil types, and certain management practices. And I know in Australia, our environments vary massively across our country. So at this stage, I can't see one root system architecture being a, doing well for the whole of Australia. But as I said, further research needs to go into this area. So I just wanted to um, thank all the authors on this work. So down here is all the authors that contributed to our research on Vern and Roots, also to uh, both Lee Hickey, who's here today, and Rod Snowden, uh, who were the lead authors on this work as well. And I also just wanted to thank the BGRI for giving me this opportunity to present this research to you. So, any questions?